That was amazing. And all without a conductor. Or were you conducting, Nathan? I wasn't quite sure. I saw a little something going on there. <laughs> that, was, that was really good. You know, you guys enjoy these moments in, are you guys in college or academy? I forget. Academy, okay. Well, anyway, enjoy the next, you know, eight to uh, however many more years you have of, of high school left and college because these times of singing together are really cool, right? And then once you get out of there, you don't always have that unless you come to a church like Grass Valley where we have a choir. <laughs> so, anyway, but, but yes, beautiful, thank you. How many grew up hearing about the time of trouble? Anybody? Okay, me too. And uh, I grew up hearing about it for as long as I can remember. And for most of my life, it didn't cause me that much anxiety. I mean, there were times when I would feel a little scared and I would wonder, you know, how, where we were going to run when the Sunday law happened. Um, how we were going to survive. Would my outdoor survival skills and tools help me hide out from the persecutors, I wondered, as I played out on the hills behind our home. Could we grow enough food to feed ourselves when no one could buy or sell? These are some things that, you know, as an avenous kid, I did wonder about, didn't lose too much sleep over, but I knew some people who did, who were pretty some of my friends, a little scared. Well, what I and many around me, I think, may have missed as a kid was that I needed to focus more, or at least as much, on the promises of God as I did on the warnings in God's Word. For example, this one here, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, that actually tells us about the time of trouble. Listen to what it says if we read it in full. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Well, that sounds pretty powerful, doesn't it? He's going to stand up. He's like, I am I'm tired of my people being persecuted. And there will be a time of distress, a time of trouble such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. I should have focused at least as much on that, those promises all throughout Scripture where over and over God says, do not be afraid. Now there's this idea that there are 365 of those in the Bible. I don't think that's true. You can look it up. But there are a lot, at least scores of them, scores of times when God says, when an angel says, when the Bible promises that we don't need to be afraid. For I am with you. Who's with us? The God of the universe, the one who created all of this. There's that promise in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16, that says, Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Oh yeah, we could parse exactly when that's going to happen and how, but it's still a promise that's there. Amen? We've got to focus on these, friends. We could, we could remember Jesus' words right before he went to the cross that pertain to the end of time, where he told his disciples... Let not your heart be troubled. The word there in the Greek is shaken. Don't let your heart shake with fear. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to do what? Prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself. That is his promise. I had forgotten the biblical admonition in Matthew chapter 10, 28 as a kid. I didn't, didn't think about this one as much. Listen to this. Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. This isn't talking about the immortal soul, by the way. This is the context here is they can't take away your eternal life. 
Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. There is a healthy sense of awe, fear, if you will, that actually is part of that first angel's message. Fear God. Yeah. Don't be afraid of all this other stuff in the world. In fact, if you fear God, you don't have to fear anyone else. That's the good news. This is the message that we have been given as God's last day movement. And by the way, another thing that some of us missed, when I was a kid at least, is that the end of time isn't really the end at all. It's the end of the misery and the suffering and the persecution, yes, but, but ultimately it's just the beginning of what? Of eternal life. It's the beginning of heaven. It's the beginning. In fact, the Bible calls this, this culmination, it calls it the blessed hope. And yet sometimes we are so depressed and so scared about the end of time that we forget that it's the blessed hope. At least I was. I don't know about you. Well, here's the deal, though. I get it. Well, Christians should not be living in fear. We aren't unique in our struggle with fear. Right? Especially about the end of time. Even non-religious people have a sense that civilization as we know it, is a somewhat fragile thing, don't they? Sure. One disruption in the the supply chain and millions and millions of people can suffer from hunger or whatever it may be. Our global interdependence can be disrupted. uh, It's a weakness if there's a natural or man-made disaster that causes a disruption in the way the world operates. Which has led some people to think ahead. And they say, hey, listen, we need a plan for the future. How do I survive if there's no food in the grocery store or no electricity to run my heater or my refrigerator? What happens if nuclear war breaks out or social unrest leads to violence? And, 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 and these questions are not bad ones to ask, are they? No. The Bible isn't silent about making wise preparation for the future. In fact, if you go to Proverbs chapter 6, you know this one probably, uh, the Bible says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Right? Who, having no overseer or guide, prepares its food in the summer and gathers its food at harvest. Right? So the ant is, is given to us an ex- as an example of, of being wise, of planning ahead. It's good to have a savings account for the rainy day, to learn how how to grow your own food if you can, right? It's good to to, to, to learn these skills, to to learn some of those outdoorsmanship skills, to, to be in good physical shape, not just because you feel guilty because you've heard about the Adventist health message, but because it's just smart to do, and you might live longer too, and live better, right? It's good to have a backup plan and a a go bag in case of a fire, to learn skills that can help us when we don't have the conveniences of life. These are good things. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 12 says that the prudent sees danger and takes refuge, but the simple keep going on and are punished. In fact, you can know, there's some Bible stories, of course, where God commanded Noah to plan ahead. He said, hey, build an ark so people can go into it and we'll be safe. So there are times when God has commanded this. Uh, Joseph, good example. Joseph said, listen, by the way, again, at God's direction, Joseph had the wisdom to tell Pharaoh, we need to store up during these seven years of plenty because there's seven years of famine that are going to be coming. And so there are biblical examples of being smart, of using our head. But I want to focus on something a little different today, because I think the world even recognizes that. There are people that say, yeah, we should be smart. But we as Christians take a little different approach to it, I would argue. A little different approach. I'm going to argue that. You can agree or disagree, but let me share why I think that. See, well, I believe we should be wise in how we plan for the time between now and the great deliverance. I'm going to call it the great deliverance, because that's what it is. We as followers of Jesus know that our hope 
is not in the things of this life or in this world. Are we in agreement? That is not our ultimate hope. Not our ultimate hope. We should hold, I would argue, these earthly possessions and even our skills and abilities that God has given us, we should hold them lightly, if you will, realizing that our gold and our silver and our houses and our lands and even our food that we may store up can be gone in a moment, just like that. Taken by fire or theft, our life can be gone, disaster can happen, and that our only ultimate solid rock is Jesus Christ. Not even our own abilities or our possessions. And we have to realize that our ultimate salvation will not come from anything here on earth. And in fact, I think that we as God's people have to have as our first priority something even greater than our own survival. Say with me. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, said this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, what does that mean? That's a command. Does it mean not having a savings account? Well, I don't know that that's what it means. But I think what Jesus is trying to say here is don't make that your primary focus. God will lead you to tell you what that means for you. And then he says this, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But here's what we should do. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the essence right here at the very end of what Jesus is trying to tell us. Because where we put our treasure, our heart will follow. This is a law of nature. This is a law of psychology. That if we, that our heart will follow our actions. If we invest our time, our money, our thought in the things of heaven, our heart, our desires, our passion will be in heaven. That's a revolutionary thought, isn't it? What does that mean, practically speaking? In the context of the end of time, Jesus said this. Look at this. This is in Luke chapter 21. So if you have your Bible, you can grab it, and we're going to spend a bit of time in the gospel of Luke today. Um, Luke is my favorite gospel, and it was written by a doctor. I ended up marrying a doctor, and I think that's why I like Luke so much. I don't know, but it's, it's a good book. I like the way doctors think, I think is what it is. All right, Luke chapter 21 Jesus wrote these words about the end of time. Look what he said in verse 34. Now this is, a, again, one of those admonitions, those warnings that also has a promise. Jesus said, verse 34 of Luke chapter 21, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be, what's the word next in your Bible? Overcharged, some Bibles say. I'm reading from the New King James, it says, weighed down. Doesn't sound real good, right? Your hearts be weighed down with a bunch of things here. Carousing and drunkenness. And most of you are probably skipping over those two because you're like, I'm not a carouser and I'm not a drunkard. Okay. But look at this next one. And the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Anybody here identify with me when, you, uh, when I say that the cares of life can sap my energy sometimes. Make you feel just, you know, maybe the anxieties of life. The fear of life. Anybody else? Jesus said, be careful. Take heed to yourself. This is not my, my dream for your life, he says. Let not your heart be troubled. I've got something better for you. You don't need to let your heart be weighed down. That's good news, friends. Don't you love that? Doesn't that give you freedom to know that God doesn't want you to be worried? God doesn't want you to be afraid of anything in this world. Amen? It, it's not only a, a, a command, it's a promise. He says, take heed yourselves. Don't be weighed down with the cares of this life. 
and that day come on you unexpectedly. By the way, if we're so focused, what he's saying here is if we're so focused on the cares of this life, the day of the Lord will come on us unexpectedly. We're focused on the wrong thing. Did you get that? If you are, it'll, it'll come on you unexpectedly. It's going to come as a, a snare on all those who dwell on the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I mean, that's just a whole bunch there we could talk about. But that first part, give attention to this. Don't let your heart become bowed way down with the distractions, the anxiety about things pertaining to this life. That's actually what it means in the Greek. Put your treasure instead in heaven. How do you do that? It's, it's through your actions. Your heart will follow your, where your, you spend your time, your money, and your thought. I heard a story uh, a few weeks ago, true story, that kind of illustrated some of this for me about priorities. And then I want to tell you a Bible story about priorities. It happened in 2007, a few years ago, um, on Thanksgiving Day. A nine-year-old little boy, his name is Chris Buckleitner, was standing with a mirror from, the, from a van, broken off the side of his mother's van a few minutes earlier, standing on a road all by himself in the middle, middle of the Arizona desert. What had happened is, as Chris and his mom had been driving their van uh, back from a day of mountain biking, back to their campsite out in the Arizona desert, something had happened, the sun maybe got in his mom's eyes, Chris doesn't know to this day what happened, and she had driven off the road, the van had rolled down the hill. The van was still running. Chris's mother was trapped. Her arm was bleeding. She was unconscious. Nine-year-old Chris reached up, turned off the van, wrapped his mother's arm in a blanket, and told her he was going to look for help. He climbed up the hill. He's standing there. He grabbed the broken off mirror of the van, thought maybe he could signal one of the helicopters he'd seen flying earlier, the Border Patrol helicopters, and so he was standing there waiting. You see, Chris's father had died two months earlier. His mother, who had been in the van with him, was a former park ranger, and she'd been anxious to get back out of doors and start, you know, camping and doing stuff again. It was a rough time for her and her son, obviously. And here they were. And now she laid in that crumpled van down the hill as Chris had climbed up to look for help. She later died in the van. There were a few miles between Chris and the Mexican border. And Chris had recently seen that Border Patrol helicopter, and he thought, you know, I'm going to see if I can get them. And his mother's cell phone wasn't working. And as he stood there in the gathering dust, suddenly he saw a stranger walking up the road. The man who was walking toward him, his name was Manuel Cordova. The man had come from Mexico, crossed the border illegally. He was coming on his way to Tucson or Phoenix. He wanted to come up and start a new life. And so as he was walking up this road, this was his third attempt. He'd been deported a couple times, and here he was, third time. He's like, I'm going to make it this time. I got a family back home in Mexico. I want to send some money to them. And, and so here he was. He was standing on the road, and right ahead of him was this little boy all by himself in the middle of the desert. Manuel later said he had a choice to make. If he stayed to help, he would likely get caught again. But then here was a nine-year-old boy who needed his help. He had kids of his own back home in Mexico, and, and a battle was raging in his heart as he stood there. Work had been hard to come by back home, even decent jobs like the one he had in Mexico paid about $100 a week, but he wanted to do better. Two daughters already, a third on the way, and so here he was evading authorities. This is, he'd been out there in the desert. He'd gotten separated from his group, and, 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 and now he was almost, almost to his destination. What was he going to do? Man, well thought of his own children. They were around the same age. He knew he'd want someone to do this for them. 
And so he decided to stay. He built a fire. And finally, after flagging down some quail hunters and using their satellite phone, help arrived for little Chris, along with the Border Patrol. But something in Manuel had changed in the night as he had stayed there with Chris, waiting until help came. He decided that, that was where he needed to be. His priorities had shifted. And as I read this story about someone with one goal over here, but then life, cha- life happened and his, and his priorities changed, it made me ask myself, what is more important in life? My own goals and dreams or what God has for us? In a world where we're told it's all about our own survival, about getting ahead ourselves, we as Christians take a different tack, don't we? God is calling us to live differently. So I want to take you today, okay? All right, Luke chapter 16. Here's the story I want to spend a few minutes on with you today. Luke chapter 16. Jesus here in the Gospel of Luke, again, tells a story to the disciples about priorities. The story here, let me just summarize it for you, is about a a rich man and a somewhat successful crook who was his manager. Now, this story used to perplex me because as I would read this story, I thought, what in the world is this story doing in the Bible? Along with the next one, by the way, in this chapter. Two weird stories, right, side by side, right? The the, the parable of the um, unjust steward and the parable of the rich man allows us. Anyway, that's another story for another day. But... uh, This one here, what's it doing in the Bible? Jesus, what are you doing giving us this story about someone who is commended for being a very good swindler? Well, what do we have to learn? So the Bible starts us out in verse uh, 1 of chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples, all right, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. We don't know who accused. We don't know how he found out. But somehow, word gets back to the owner of the estate, that his main man is actually a fraud, a fraudster, okay? So here he is. By the way, the manager here, the steward, is essentially uh, the guy who's pretty much in charge of everything. So he has free reign. He's been doing this job probably for a while, and again, somehow, word gets up to the owner that things are not going well. So verse 2, he calls him and he says to him, Uh, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Now, the interesting part of this story is that this owner did not follow customary HR practices like we do today, right? You know this is happening. What do you do? You call in security. They accompany fraudster back to his desk. He clears out his stuff, and he's escorted from the building, right? Right? In this case, it seems like the owner is saying, hey, you're on probation for a little while, or even if you are fired, you still have access to the books. Um, Come back next week, and I want to see a full accounting of everything. So the story in this little interlude here, he's not fired yet, or at least he somehow still has access to the rich man's books. Look what happens in verse 3. Then the steward of the manager says to himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I'm going to get fired. I know that. Because yes, I have wasted his goods. I cannot dig. Now, why not? Is he lazy? Probably. Is he a wimp? Maybe. He can't dig. He's like, I just, I'm not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. Okay, doesn't want to do that. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, hasn't happened yet, he's going to get fired, they may receive me into their houses. Okay, and this is where the story gets a little interesting. By the way, I find this fascinating because the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14 that in verse 7, that at the end of time, a message goes out to the world that says, Fear God, give glory to him, because what? The hour of his judgment has come. Okay? So this is a message that goes out that talks about a judgment that happens before Jesus returns. Right? 
so we as Seventh-day Adventists have coined this term called the investigative judgment. It's not in the Bible, but the idea is there. This concept of an investigation happening. It's not the execution part of the judgment, but the investigation part. And that's what's happening in this story, interestingly enough. There's an investigation going on here. And I would suggest to you that Jesus' conclusion in this story is a message to us, those of us living during the judgment hour. It is an admonition for us who are living during the time of investigative judgment. Let's learn what that admonition is. So the manager here, as he is called to give an account, has one thought. And who is that thought about, by the way? Himself. He has one thought. It is his survival, his comfort, his bed, a roof over his head. That's a little rhyme for my kids. I know Eli would like that. Did you hear that? No? His comfort, his bed, a roof over his head. Anyway, and so he decides to take what he still has of his masters, which is access to the books, power, that's what he still has, and he's going to engage in a little bribery for his own benefit. Right? So that's what he does. And so he goes to his master's debtors in verse 5. He calls each one of his master's debtors. He asks the first, how much do you owe my master? Now, this is an interesting little snippet here because it tells me he didn't really know himself. He's a very bad manager. This guy is not doing his job, is he? I mean, if, if he would know if, if he kept the books, wouldn't he? How much do you owe my master? I don't know how much you owe. And the guy's like, oh, I, a thousand bushels of wheat. Okay, well, you take your bill and you make it, you're going to say, we're going to fudge the records and we're going to say it's just 800. Wink, wink. All right. Actually, I'm sorry, the first one was 900. I skipped, skipped verse 6. 900 gallons of olive oil. Okay, you take your bill and you make it 450. That's cutting it in half. Oh, nice. Then the second, how much do you owe? 1,000 bushels a week. You make it 800. Now, between verses 7 and 8, the Bible doesn't tell us, but apparently somehow there is, he gets called on the carpet and we assume he gets fired. But in the meantime, he has ingratiated himself. He's made himself a friend of some people who are going to help him when he gets thrown out on his ear. And so in verse 8, the master, the owner, commends the dishonest manager because he acted what? Shrewdly or wisely. And then Jesus concludes with these words that I think are the ones for us living in this time of the judgment hour. For the people of this world, he said, are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, your worldly wealth, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your worldly wealth. What is your worldly wealth? It could be anything. It could be your money, your time, your health, your influence. It could be all of those things. It is all of those things. And Jesus says, use what you have now, your life, your essence, whatever the, the essence of life is for you, to gain friends for yourselves where? No, not just going out and, and thinking of yourself in that sense, but you're making friends somewhere else. Some place that has what kind of dwellings? eternal dwellings. By the way, how do we do this? And by the way, who are those friends? Let me ask you that first. Who are the friends that are going to welcome you into eternal dwellings? Who is it? God the Holy Spirit, amen? That's who I plan to welcome me into heaven, don't you? Jesus says, make friends there so that when you fail, when your life is done, when all of this is gone, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. He goes on to tell us in verses 10 all the way down through 13, whoever is trusted can be trusted with very little. In other words, what you have now can also be trusted with much up there. Whoever is dishonest with very little now 
will be dishonest with much then. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, what you've been given now, who will trust you with true riches up there? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, by the way, you are someone else's property. Whose? God's. The Bible says you are bought with a price. Jesus gave his life for you. If we have not been trustworthy stewards of what God has given us now and doing it for his glory, uh, living our lives now in a way that honors him, who will give you property of your own? And he says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, or mammon, or I would say that would include anything that is our own self-centered interests. We have a choice. We can serve God, or we can serve ourselves. How do we do this? How do we make friends who will receive us into an everlasting home? Well, by serving just one master, Jesus tells us here. Can't serve yourself and me at the same time. You can't be in it for yourself and thinking somehow you're going to gain heaven. You can only serve one master. Which brings us back to that admonition of Jesus earlier where he says, listen, your heart's going to follow your actions. Right? Where you put your time, your energy, and your thought, your actions, your heart will follow. So I want to get practical for a few minutes. I want to talk about how we do that. And something that God has been speaking to me recently, and I know to many of you as well, is to say, he's saying to us, I want you to start praying more. I want you to start with prayer. And pray this prayer, friends. Here's this prayer. God, change my heart so that I will love what you love and care about what you care about. You want to pray that prayer? God, change my heart so that I will love what you love and care about what you care about, God. I want my priorities to be aligned with your heart, God. So, friends, today, if you want to be practical, tell God today, God, I'm going to set aside 15 minutes every day. Maybe it's in the middle of my day. If you're too tired when you wake up, or if it's going to put you to sleep at night, do it in the middle of the day. 15 minutes, if that's what it takes to start out with, when I'm going to talk with you and listen for your voice. You're going to ask God, Lord, how do you want me to spend my time? Lord, what do you want me to be focused on? Lord, can I be focused on, can you make me focused on what you are focused on, Lord? What about my money, God? Am I spending it on what you want me to spend it on? We've been reading through a book the last few weeks in uh, one of our small groups here on Wednesday night uh, by Jim Cimbala, and uh, he um, has a lot of good stuff to say in there. One of the things he says is this, anytime people get hungry to truly know the Lord, the Holy Spirit quickly puts a shovel and a broom in their hands. <laughs> Maybe not literally, but husbands and wives begin to deal with long-buried issues hurting their marriages. This is practical, right? Adults take a closer look at their choice of TV programs and movies. Church members begin to see the damage wreaked by their gossip, their racial attitudes, their criticism. God gets real with us when we say, God, I want you to start working in my life. By the way, this isn't all negative and like, I'm not trying to like berate anybody here. I hope that doesn't come across that way. I'm just talking to myself here. But, but here's the deal. When we open our hearts up to Jesus, we have peace and contentment and joy. God takes our lives and says, listen, all that anxiety and that worry and that fear that he talks about that we don't want to burden our hearts down with, he, he delivers us from that. You know, it's, it's a process. It doesn't all happen at once. We, we have a purpose in life because we're aligning ourselves with, with God's purpose, with his priorities, with who he made us to be. I love this little quote. I, I have some quotes I keep on my phone, um, and, and they're on my little calendar. And if I just need something, I'll go in there and I'll read those quotes. And here's one that I read often. It's from the Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Listen to this. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day, 
Okay, there's the condition. Seek God. God, please convert me today. If you will of your own spiritual choice, listen to this, be free and joyous in God. That's a choice. God says, listen, I want you to be happy, free. I don't want this anything burdening your heart down. If with gladsome consent of heart to his gracious call, you come wearing the yoke of Christ, the yoke of obedience and service, okay? Listen, here's, here's the promise. All your murmurings will be stilled. All your difficulties will be removed. I mean, this is, this is getting better, isn't it? All the perplexing problems that now confront you will be solved. I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing promise. It does, I don't think it means that we won't have problems. It just means that God's going to be like, hey, man, I got this. Let's just go through this together. I'm going to give you that peace that only I can give. All right, so we have a choice to make, much like Manuel Cordova on that road there. Are, are, are my priorities your priorities, Lord? When faced with the decision, Manuel decided to save a nine-year-old boy, even if it meant sacrificing his own dreams. And I, I think God wants people whose hearts are in tune with his like that as well. Because God's heart is seeking and saving the lost, is it not? Where is God's heart? It's with the suffering. It's with the lost. It's with those who need him. It's with us too, by the way, because we are those people, but for the grace of God. What's it going to look like in the last days as God's people are saying, God, I'm putting your priorities first. Your priorities are my priorities, God. What does it look like? Okay, you want to see what it looks like? Let me take you to a couple verses real quick here. Go to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Look, look at what the promise is. This is beautiful. Revelation 18. John writes these words. He says, after these things, boy, all sorts of stuff happening there in chapter 17. After all the bad stuff, during the bad stuff, right? Look at this. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And what happened? The earth was illuminated with his glory. This is a prophecy. By the way, it comes right out of Isaiah. John is borrowing from Isaiah where he says, gross darkness will cover the people, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen everywhere. You see, this angel represents us. It represents you. It represents anyone in the last days who are saying, God, I just want to follow you, Jesus. I want your priorities to be my priorities. And God says, listen, my glory, my brightness, my beauty is going to shine upon you and through you to a world. We're like, a, we're like the moon in the sky, right? We reflect the light of Jesus. And that glory is going to be reflected to the world in a time of great darkness in our world. Are we living in a time of great darkness? Absolutely. Are we living in a time of moral darkness? Absolutely. Is it a time... Of, of spiritual darkness in our world? Absolutely. But listen, friends, we can focus, and we have to. Sometimes we have to talk about all that stuff, but I think we also need to focus on the promises. Do you agree? We've got to focus on these promises. Here is what God wants to do in these last days. He wants to speak a message. Look at verse 4 of chapter 18. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. Ellen White put it this way, what is God's priority? What are his priorities? What are his people's priorities in the last days? Listen to this, listen to this. One question will be all-absorbing. Here it is, who shall approach nearest the likeness of Christ? Who shall do most to win souls to righteousness? When this is the ambition of believers, contention is at an end, the prayer of Christ is answered. We are just like, Jesus, I just want to bring people to you. We don't care about who is better than anyone else or who's got this or doesn't have that. We're just here to say, Jesus, we're just focused on this one mission. Do you want to be a part of that? Don't you want to be a part of that as a church? Oh, man, L listen, here's another one. I love this one, too. When, the, when we love the world as he loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. 
We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. God's priority is to seek and to save the lost. This is what he's all about. And when our hearts are aligning with that, we're saying, God, I'm here. I'm here to spend my earthly life, my treasures, whatever I've got to make friends for heaven, to make friends above, then we are ready for heaven. And by the way, the Bible says that when we do it for the least of these, we do it for Jesus. When we bring souls to Jesus, we are making friends of God for eternity. This will be the primary focus of God's people at the end, I believe, to be like Jesus, to bring people to Jesus. This is what it means to lay up treasure in heaven. This is how to survive when the world goes crazy because Luke chapter 17, just a couple chapters later, Jesus tells us this. Listen to these words, Luke 17, verse 33. Jesus says, whoever may seek to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake will save it. Talk about flipping things on its head, right? But Jesus says, no, no, no. If you seek first my kingdom, if you come and say, Jesus, I will spend it all for your kingdom, don't worry. Even if you lose your earthly life, I got you. In fact, when we use our worldly wealth, our time, our influence to make friends above, when we do it to the least of these, we are but doing it to Jesus himself. All right, I want to tell you a story here today. I mean, I've told this one. I don't know if, I don't think I shared it here before, but a couple weeks ago, I went to hear my friend, former seminary professor of mine, uh, Pastor Jeff as well, um, Pastor Joe Kidder. And I think Jeff would agree, he was, he was one of our good teachers. You know, you, you got the good ones, and he was one of those. And uh, Pastor Kidder has written some books. He may have told this story in his book, but he tells the story of a church that he was assigned much to his um, displeasure. And the church only had, I think, eight people coming, eight or nine people. The head elder at this church was a really unfriendly dude. And, like, he, would, he literally did not like Pastor Kidder, you know, brand new pastor coming in, kind of young guy at this point, too. And he would, uh, every time he wanted to make a point at board meeting, he would stand up and, uh, I don't know if he would hit the table, but he would basically say, no, we're not going to do that. It doesn't work, and here's why. And this was the board meeting. So, so Pastor Kidder thought, you know, I'm just going to pray. So he began to pray. And I've told you some of his prayer stories before. But uh, this time he began to pray. And he would preach about prayer. But what Pastor Kidder didn't know was that Edna, one of his members, who was about 80 years old, had taken Pastor Kidder's messages to heart. And she had begun to pray. And keep in mind that all the people in this church were, most of them were over the age of, I'd say, 75 or so. And there had been so much infighting in this church and dissension that there were like just eight people. That's it. They were not growing. Things were not going well. Edna decided to pray. She wanted her priorities aligned with God. So she began to pray specifically for her 25-year-old neighbor who, whose name, I believe, was Michelle. Praying for Michelle. Now, Michelle and Edna couldn't have been more different. Edna was about 80 years old. Michelle was 25. Edna went to church. She was a very prim and proper church lady. And Michelle was the exact opposite of that. In fact, she had lots of parties and a different guy staying there every day, it seemed like. And, but Edna prayed for her, and, and she would then show her love in different ways. And so Pastor Kidder, around this time, had told his church board, hey, I'd like to do an evangelistic series. And the head elder stood up and said, no, we don't do those. They don't work. And Pastor Kidder <laughs> tells the story. He said, listen, um, if you'll let me do one evangelistic series, I promise you I'll never ask you for anything again. And so the head elder said, all right, it's a deal, but we have to get it in writing. 
He must, may have been a lawyer. I don't know. Anyway, so they drew it up. Pastor Kidder signed it. I will never ask you for anything again if, I, if I'm allowed to do this evangelistic series. First night of the evangelistic series, there are eight people there. It's the same eight people that come to church. Pastor Kidder is very discouraged. He continues to pray. Again, he didn't know that Edna had been praying as well. I think it was the second or third night of the evangelistic series. Again, eight people every night. Second or third night, there are nine people there that night. That night, it's the original eight, but then Edna had brought her 25-year-old neighbor, Michelle. Michelle had been going through a crisis. Something had happened, and Edna had found out about it. She'd heard the yelling and the screaming or whatever. She'd gone over and she said, you should come to my church. And so she'd come. And here she was, 25-year-old uh, Michelle, sitting there. And Pastor Kidder, as she walked in, he thought, I've got to change my sermon tonight. He was going to preach about, I don't know what exactly, but he thought, I've got to preach something, because he, he thought, this gal needs something different. And so he totally switched it up. He started to preach about Jesus in a way that he knew would be for this, this gal. And she stayed after the meeting, and they prayed together till late that night, and Edna was there, and they all prayed, and she gave her heart to Jesus that night. And the next day at the evangelistic series, I don't want to exaggerate the story because I don't remember exactly the details. As Pastor Kidder walked into the church, there were like 50 people there. Michelle knew everyone in town. Remember the story in John 4, the woman at the well? This was the woman at the well, okay? Okay. Michelle knew everyone in town, and she went to her friends the next day, and she said, you've got to come. Jesus has changed my life. You've got to come to church with me. And Michelle brought her friends to that little struggling, dying church of eight people, and they came for the rest of the evangelistic series. And at the end of the evangelistic series, there were, maybe my wife can help me out, like 20, 30 people baptized, I don't remember. And, and that church was changed that night. The head altar came to Pastor Joe and said, you can do another evangelistic series if you want to. I mean, this is what God wants to do, isn't it? When we align our priorities with his and it's, it's not really about something big necessarily. It's often the small things. It's what Edna did, isn't it? It's just about praying. God, what do you want to do through me? We expect God to do big things, but don't despise the small things. It can look like the dad or mom who says, I'm going to have regular daily family worship with my kids. Maybe that's what you're, because remember, ministry starts at home. If you're out evangelizing the, your neighbors and, you, and your home's a mess, go back home and start there. It can look like the doctor or the nurse who prays for their patients and, or prays for their patients, and if the Holy Spirit leads, prays with them, right? It's the teacher who's looking for opportunities to tell our students about Jesus. It's the grandparent who's loving their grandkid and praying for their grandkid who doesn't know Jesus. It's that believer who teams up with someone else and says, I'm going to start a Bible study at Starbucks, and we're going to invite co-workers over, right? It's, it's the believer who mows their neighbor's lawn or, you know, takes them a plate of cookies or whatever it is. That's making friends above, isn't it? And I'm not going to tell you it's always going to be easy, but I'm going to tell you that there's a day coming when, boy, it's going to be so happy. <laughs> it's happy now, but it's going to be amazing. When you see someone that you've brought to Jesus, that you've had a hand in, in, in maybe just helping them along the way, and they're in heaven, Nothing can equal that. Nothing in this world can equal that. And it's all about aligning our priorities with God. God, God, what do you want me to care about right now? Where do you want my focus to be in life, God? For the eyes of God, the Bible tells us, range to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen the hearts of those who are fully committed to him. Jim Simbola writes this. Next slide, if you could do that. He says, today God's eyes are still running all across America and Canada and Mexico and the islands of the sea of the world, looking for someone, anyone, who will totally and passionately seek him, who is determined that every thought and action will be pleasing in his sight. For such a person or group, God will prove himself mighty. His power will explode on their behalf. 
Okay, I'm almost done. Acts 4.29, the church prays. They say, God, we want our priorities to be aligned with yours. Okay? Peter and John have just gotten out of jail. They've been told, don't go preach in the name of Jesus. Look at Acts 4.29. The church gets together and look at their prayer. Acts 4.29 through 31. Here's what they pray. They don't pray, God, we're scared. Keep us safe. Hey, nothing's wrong with that prayer. But God's like, no, no. I want you to, I got bigger things for you than your mere survival. Bigger things. I want to use you to bring people to my kingdom. Look what they pray. Acts 4, 29. Now, Lord, they pray, look on their threats. Oh, yes, they're being persecuted. The world has gone crazy. But here's what they pray. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Can somebody say amen? God, give us boldness to speak your word. Because our world needs it. They need the hope that we have. Look what they say. By stretching out your hand to heal Jesus, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. God, do something that will grab the attention of those who do not know you. Do something to turn this world upside down. God, use us if you can. Stretch out your hand to heal. Look at verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. It will happen again. And it is happening. Don't you want to be a part of it? Lord, let's pray. Lord, align our priorities with yours. God, let us put our treasure in heaven. Let us make friends above with our worldly talents so that when our lives here on this earth end you can welcome us into those eternal dwellings amen